So this is an ad hoc tool. So uh, that means uh, that it's half baked, uh, or probably not even a quarter baked. Um, but this is uh, an attempt to think about an idea which I saw some very clever people who are mathematicians who do graph theory uh, talking about being a challenge. And I thought, well, how about we make a very simple intervention and think of a very simple approach to solving this problem, um, uh, or not necessarily solving the problem, but at least describing systems um, um, that, that uh, exhibit these nice uh, phenomena. So, so this is about um, random graphs and various types of random graphs. Uh, so random graphs show up all over nature and, and, and artifices like uh, uh, the internet and transportation and so on. And um, they're, they're, they're not purely random. We'll, we'll, I'm going to go through a bit of the history um, uh, and a bit of description about kinds of uh, random graphs and ways of making random graphs that have other properties. And then uh, along the way, describe a bit about um, uh, what the idea is. And it's definitely half-baked. I haven't got any quantitative or qualitative evaluation of this idea. So the idea is to act, use all, you, all of you, as a distributed, multi-dimensional filter to decide if it's bogus, <laughs> right? And if it is, then we save ourselves, save ourselves an awful lot of time. Um, so, um, and the idea is based in just purely observing what happens in some kinds of graphs out there. And the idea is to also be able to, uh, well, to think about what a model might be that can generate random graphs. But the point of the word generational there is not to do with generating, it's to do with uh, generations. Uh, so generations as in uh, uh, children and grandchildren and so on, or if you're into science fiction, you're Star Trek NG or anything NG. Um, so the generational um, starships <laughs> was the idea of how the humans would ever get to uh, any of the exoplanets around one of those stars out there. We're not really likely to make anything that goes fast enough to do it in a sensible amount of time. So probably what you want to do is build something big enough that you put the colony on, the colony on there and the great grandchildren of the people who get to the other, the other planet. Uh, and so I'm very pleased that all these physicists are finding our escape routes, you know, so when we finally screw this planet up, we'll actually have some way of getting there, and it will involve generational spaceships. So that's not to do with random graphs. Well, it might be, actually. It could be, I suppose, over time, you might populate more and more planets further and further out until you get into some kind of future empire, uh, which will be very, very loose-knit, because it will take you know, three generations to communicate with any other planet uh, of, of any interest. Um, and there are lots of science fiction books about that kind of thing. Probably the earliest good one is... Uh, the foundation series so going back to about 1948 by uh, Asimov. Okay, enough wittering on about what the generational bit is about. Um, the key starting point for this was I was sitting in the back in a year and a half ago workshop here, before we were in this bit of the building, um, on networks. And I think uh, various people talked about the problem is that um, a lot of networks aren't static and or homogeneous. Um, so what do we mean by that? Well, well, so networks grow and shrink, right? So family networks grow and shrink as people are born and people die. Uh, communication networks grow and shrink as we add links or we, we take links out. Uh, transportation networks grow and shrink, and the properties of the network vary over time, uh, clearly. And also, their uh, networks are not homogeneous. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, a family network is made up of adults and children and retired people, uh, uh, and a communication network is made out of uh, wireless links and fiber optic and copper links, and transportation is made out of planes, trains, and automobiles, and so on. Okay, so these are not homogeneous. And each of those uh, generations, if you like, uh, they may be not generations, but they may be from the same generation, but each, each of the, um, those different parts of the network may have somewhat different properties. Um, so the basic idea here is to, to take some of the simple descriptions of networks that have the more interesting properties we care about in, um, that we observe, measure, uh, and try to adapt those models to include this temporal nature um, at its generational, I claim, uh, and the heterogeneous nature of the network, so that there, there's more than one parameter, if you like. But rather than make the thing too complicated, some papers uh, on this area that I've read, I have not read a lot on this, I'm not a graph theory person, but some papers go into this incredibly complicated heterogeneous model where you have some continuous variables that describe everything about you know, every single node and edge in the network, every vertex and edge. Let's just try and keep something very, very simple. So that's this basic idea of generational. So that's kind of, um, and what I'm going to sort of briefly allude to is these very simple models of getting not just a random graph, but a random graph that, that looks like something we see in uh, natural and artificial networks, which is um, preferential attachment and some kind of notion of clustering and some kind of small world properties. So, um, 
So we want to keep those, but we don't want to make the whole thing too general. Um, of course, there are lots of examples of small world networks. If you go to A minor, it's quite a nice um, um, co-authorship uh, system for looks through your bibliographic databases, searches for everything, a bit like Google Scholar and whatever, and you can find all the people you write things with. And if you ask it right, you can find uh, your distance from you to another person you haven't written things to, but you've written, pap written papers with somebody who's written with them and so on. And you can do this for all kinds of other systems. Um, this, is, this is the only one I know that's currently does this kind of fancy graphing of things on you. Um, why, why do you kind of care about this? Um, why do you care about co-authorship graphs? Well, you could, for example, be an academic and you care about your ref return and you want to know that your papers are going to be really cited and good, right? So if you're selfishly thinking about optimizing how good your papers look at. So a student I helped supervise in Cambridge, it's a guy called Hyung Shik Kim, very smart Korean student who was working partly in security. And he realized that when he went back to, to South Korea, that the um, secu Koreans did not have a great security research community. And so he, he started looking at the co-authorship graphs of papers in the security world. And then he ruthlessly wrote papers with people so that when he went back to Korea, he would be the hub of the Korean network. And he'd already have a good citation graph. Awesome, right? So he, he literally, and of course he had to write good papers, but what he did was he made himself visible. He became a sort of, you know, the, the, a hub, which is, you know, a trick. He got centrality in the, in the graph uh, for his bit of the world. And then, and then, of course, then what happens? Well, then he starts to get preferential attachment. Anyone else thinking of working in security and who's going to Korea or is from Korea goes, aha, he's the go-to person, right? So the processes matter and the, the, the graph properties matter. But of course, notice, notice, I've already given you two things there. You know, there's a temporal nature. He moved, he was in Cambridge, then he went to Korea. He came from Korea to Cambridge, then went back. Um, and there's the um, heterogeneity. There was, you know, there was this very weak graph in Korea, although there are plenty of good computer science places in Korea. Uh, for sure. Um, I mean, certainly in Seoul University and, and uh, De uh, KAIST and Daejeon and probably others, well, those two I know well, top, you know, computer science. In fact, interesting enough, there are a couple of people there who do seriously good social network analysis. <laughs> so graph and analytics. Uh, Myung Cha was a professor at KAIST. Uh, uh, she was a PhD student and she became one of the first professors who worked in this area. So, so it's heterogeneity across the world, right? The network is not, so it's not that simple. So um, the other thing is, of course, there's another form of heterogeneity, and this is possibly the, my favorite example of heterogeneity, which is you can have a social graph, but the edges could be defined in different ways. So this is the Erdos Bacon Sabbath project. And I encourage you to visit this website because it's hilarious. So Erdos, of course, Erdos Renyi is the, the, the two mathematicians who came up with the basics of random graphs. We're gonna look at it in a second. So basic random graphs is, you know, you. You're building a graph and you just randomly attach to another node with some probability, okay? So famously, Erdos didn't really stay in one place. He went around the world writing papers just about anyone he met. And so if you have written a paper with Erdos, which from now on is difficult because <laughs> he's dead, um, but you would have, you'd have an Erdos number one. And if you've written a paper, somebody's written a paper with Erdos, it's two and so on. So I think I have three because I've written a paper with Frank Kelly and I'm, I have either three or two, but... Um, Okay, so Kevin Bacon. Has anyone heard of Kevin Bacon? I'm sure some of you have. He's in those really annoying TV ads. But he's a sort of second-tier Hollywood star. He's all right, you know, he's not that annoying in movies. He's a pretty good actor. Um, so Kevin Bacon number is, have you been in a movie with Kevin Bacon? And if you have, you've got one. And if you're in a movie with somebody who was in a movie with him, you've got two. And then Sabbath, of course, is Black Sabbath. The, the now, you can't play with Black Sabbath anymore because they retired last month. But, you know, they played for 40 years. So people play with it. So here's the thing. Imagine you want to, you build a multigraph with all these edge types, and then you see what your distance is to somebody, you know, what is your Erdos Bacon Sabbath number? So, and there's some really interesting people on this list. I mean, some of them are real cheats, but down the end, I think there's two nice examples. Um, Brian May, the guitarist from Queen, actually jammed with Black Sabbath once. He's a you know, famous guitarist, 30 years, he's in the top band. He also fi recently finished his PhD in astrophysics at Imperial College after a 30 year break playing rock music. Um, so he's a very cool dude, you know, he did this very cool astrophysics. Uh, I read the thesis, it's fine, you know. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, having been a physicist, he wrote some papers probably with some mathematical physicists. So he's got some pretty high number. He earned us five, because he's not maths, but you know, it's five. Bacon, um, three, because he played music for a movie with somebody who then was in a movie with, you know, Kevin Bacon. And then, um, and then there's Sabbath of One, because he played with them. Natalie Portman's another interesting case, well-known actress. So um, Bacon, two. Um, 
I'm not sure where the Sabbath three came from, but she jammed in some band at college, but she did a math degree at Harvard. And she wrote a paper with her supervisor, and so she gets an odorous number of five. So, you know, it's fun, fun this, right? Why, why do we really care about that? Well, I mean, this is just to illustrate, of course, it's heterogeneous. The edges have all kinds of types. Um, if you were thinking about um, a graph which represented the encounters between all the people in the world, and Merco's done stuff on this, and, and Cecilia Mascolo, who's also visits here from UCL, does a lot of work in that space. You look at encounters between people, why do you care about that? Well, you might be an epidemiologist and you're trying to figure out which way did a disease spread, and then you might look at the, in, the probability someone encounters somebody else again in the future, and then use that to decide who to quarantine. So this was used in, famously in Nigeria a couple of years, a year and a bit back, during the Ebola epidemic. They found the, every case they found, they got their phone, they got their phone book, they got their family address books, and they found every single person in that book and quarantined all of them, and they actually shut the epidemic completely down. So that's a practical application, none of this humorous stuff, and very extremely demonstrably useful. So you, find, you build the graph, and then you go find all the people in the graph, and then you say, okay, we'll quarantine this subset of the graph to, you know, to drop the probability of. Of course, you could do something more subtle. You could be measuring encounters, and discover that people encounter somebody who's infected but they never get infected, then you discover who's got immunity. That's also really cool, right? So that's another thing you extract. So colleague Eko Yonecki in Cambridge and I did this during the H1N1 flu epidemic, and we have people measuring encounters by looking at their cell phone proximity. And then we discovered a large fraction of the population in H1N1 exhibited no symptoms, but they had actually carried the disease from somebody over there to somebody over there, so essentially asymptomatic carriers. It turns out it was, you could you do the numbers, and the uh, public health people went off and looked at this and discovered it was people over 50, and they had a herd immunity from a previous epidemic of flu, which was very genetically similar, so they had the T cells for it. That's a very useful piece of information, right? Because you could, in fact, in extreme, if it's enough of those people, you can start doing blood transfusions. You don't have to give people vaccines, which don't work very well. Um, OK, so lots of uses for this stuff. So it's not completely barking mad. But you'd like the models to be better because those homogeneous models are not very good. In particular, when the graphs are smaller, they're going to be poor fit, right? If the, if the, if the temporality, the, the temporal nature of the graph and the parameters vary a lot, then, then you're going to have a, the wrong kind of graphs and the wrong kind of models. And so, yeah, back to PowerPoint, which is much less interesting than. Um, OK, so, so just, that was just to kind of give this, illustrate there's you know, reason for doing this stuff. And, 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 and really, the interesting things with graphs are they're, they're super interesting for mathematicians, obviously. I mean, I'm not a mathematician, but I can see how you know, it's fun. And some quite simple things elaborate into a huge world of work, which I think is, is uh, the slides are on the web free if you want to download. But, but yeah, like no, absolutely fine. Um, so they're super interesting mathematically, but they're also very, very practical. They describe things in the world. And then, and crucially, we're interested in processes over the graph. So we're interested in things like infection. So you could be infected by a bad idea, like wearing a baseball cap back, back to front, right? It's a meme, well known. Uh, behavioral um, uh, and behavioral things over networks are the routing, the start root point, the starting point for a huge amount of data science was, you know, basically targeted advertising. And you figure out who's an opinion maker, so you find out who's influential in the graph. Who's a hub? Why are they a hub? They're a hub because they're influential, i.e., people pay attention to what they say on Twitter or they they do on TV or whatever it is, and so you have that, you have that uh, graph property, and it's pretty easy to find where the hubs are. Uh, well, easy, depends how big the graph is, but even a Facebook graph with one and a half billion uh, vertices, if you want to do, figure out the centrality of the whole graph or any set of central points in a graph, you're basically computing the all shortest path between everywhere and everywhere, which is not that big a deal even with a billion, uh, and use GraphX or Giraffe or some other thing you like. Um, and then you find the points that occur on, you know, just count how many times these guys show up on those. That's one form of, of centrality. There are other centrality metrics. So lots of interesting metrics. But why, why do they matter? Well, you might want to disrupt that. You might want to remove that person. So for example, if that person is uh, promiscuous, they may be the principal vector for carrying some STD, and so you might want to persuade them to stop doing something or behave differently or whatever. Um, so that's a very famous thing is where do you do your intervention? There's a somewhat contentious book by uh, a couple of Harvard, Christakis and Fowler called Connected, which I think is a good read, but they looked at two forms of influence that matter for public health. Uh, one was in obesity and the other was in smoking. And they found who were the influence, 
the, you know, the, the opinion makers in these. And it turned out it was interesting. This is in Boston, I guess, New England anyway in general. I, I, I can't remember the details, but the, the sort of take home on this work was that, uh, that working class Central European women were the strong influences for obesity because they were cooking these like, Central European foods and they would insisting you must eat up your greens, child, or whatever. You must eat up your pasta and you must eat up your rice and you must eat up your chips and so on. And of course, ha having moved to the rich America, they're far too much for you. But previously, this was a wise behavior because it's the last meal you get for another three weeks. You know, this is not a great behavior. And so influencing them to change what they cook was a good idea. And then there's the opposite where interestingly enough in giving up smoking, that uh, was um, middle class men who would give up, a middle class man giving up smoking would create sort of influence, oh, you, that's interesting. So I have no idea why. Um, and as I say, this book, the results in that book are a little bit contentious. So I'm just giving them as, you know, if they were right, they would really matter. And you can think of many other examples. You know, deep fried Mars bars are definitely a bad idea, right? Okay, so, except, you know, once in your life, just to say, yes, I've done the Glasgow crazy thing. Um, but anyway, processes of graph, those are just illustrative of some kinds of processes on a graph. Uh, let me give another example. We built a system at Microsoft Research. I was collaborating at a PhD student who, work, who works there uh, called Manuel Costa, and part of his thesis is a system called Vigilante, um, which you can look up. It's, um, and it's basically an anti-malware system. And what it does is it measures incoming traffic on the internet to a cloud service, and it looks at the behavior of the code after traffic has arrived. So a new request to a web server arrives look at what the web server does. Does it do something funny, different from usual? And if so, classify that incoming as malware. Now what do you do? Well, Manuel is super smart. He built a, what he calls a self-certifying alert, which is a thing that describes the incoming, describes its behavior, and then creates a patch which stops the behavior. So the classic uh, thing would be very simple things like buffer overrun usage, so sort of stack overflow usage or whatever. So something, something has, some person out there, some script kid is, or some clever person has noticed there's a bug in a web server by looking at the code because it's open, it's Apache or something, and they figure out I could do this request and it would see the thing and I'll be able to plant code in there and do things that I want on the web server that they don't want. So this thing detects that and then builds a patch that prevents it. And then what do we then do? We use a network to distribute the patch to everyone, but we use a network that has a faster distribution. So we, we deliberately build an interconnect for the purposes of fast patching that's better connected so that the mean path from the nodes that are doing detector and patching is shorter to everywhere than for anything else. So if the bad stuff coming in is basically infectious, it's a thing that plants code and then runs its own scanning attack, it will run slower than our patch. We can't guarantee that, but we can make it statistically so. Okay, so that's exploiting a property for, for good. Um, okay, so there's a couple of things I want to talk about in this generational model. There's, you know, we have these social media graphs and that's all the rage. And for example, detecting fake news is an interesting thing and you can do it partly by fact checking against other sites and having some distribution of trust about sites. But you might be able to do it by looking at some graph property of the fake news. It could be somewhat like spam. That the uh, spam originates typically from botnets botnets and machines have been taken over by a bunch of bad people and then rented out to other people to send typically, not necessarily evil, just adverts to people that's kind of annoying. If you look at the pattern, the graph of that, that spam, where's it coming from, where's it going to? It doesn't look like stuff a human would do. It's got the wrong temporal structure and it's got the wrong degree distribution. So you can use that to characterize spamming nodes automatically. It's not 100% effective, but it, you can add it into your mix of rules another classifier, if you like, for saying this looks like spam because it's coming from these places and they have this distribution of traffic characteristic. So this is all good fun. Um, uh, what other things would you do with you know, social media and graphs? There's all kinds of interesting stuff, but you know, telling the difference between humans and robots is probably one thing you could do. Uh, not always. The bad guys will then just be better at mimicking. You know, they'll pass the Turing test eventually. <laughs> so then what do we do? Who knows? Do we care anymore at that point? You know, you're talking to something that's a robot, but you know, it behaves exactly like a human. Does it matter at that point? That's a bit of philosophy for you. Um, a bit early in the week for philosophy, probably, sorry. Um, and then the other thing, that, so, so the point is, on, on your social network, of course, you obviously have generations. In fact, when you look at, there are generations of social network. Anyone remember MySpace um, before there was you know, Facebook? Uh, and there's anyone on Elo? Elo is really cool, actually. It's a free, 
it's basically designed for designers. Uh, go, you should check it out, it's really cool. It's just peaceful posting design. It's effectively a advertising site for very cool designers' work. So they've sort of put their portfolios on there. So there are sort of versions of entire social, but on each of the social media courses, there are, there are families as well. So I have three kids who are 19, 22, and 27, and uh, one of them is on Facebook with lies about his gender and age. One of them left Facebook because he thought it was a complete waste of time. He prefers to go to the pub and play soccer with his friends on the weekend and have tea with his girlfriend and all kinds of things. And then the other one is uh, a random, random user. So I am friends with them, um, and, which is weird, but you know, it happens. <laughs> um, but you know, I'm not friends with my 95-year-old mum because you can't see well enough to use Facebook or use a computer for that matter. Um, but obviously there are generations and they have different behaviors. In fact, when you look at the um, privacy arguments about online social media. People do studies of social media because they can, particularly Twitter, because it's quite easy to get a large fraction of tweets and do a study of, of the properties, the degree distribution of nodes and you know, the popularity and so on, and over time. And they do all that, which is kind of invasion of privacy. When you ask younger people about what they care about privacy, they say, oh, we're not that worried because we use all these cunning tricks like lying about age and gender or having five accounts and using different ones, you know, I am sure my kids have other social media accounts they use for talking to their friends, so I don't see it. I don't want to see it, please, right? So, so here we have you know, some, some stratification over time, uh, but, but, it's just, but the point is it's discrete, it's connected with generations of the users, right? And then the more, the starting point for this, this thought was hearing the mathematicians at this network uh, workshop with, um, uh, who was it? Patrick from UCL, and uh, I thought it was Jizine from um, Oxford. Uh, graph theory prof at Oxford Math Department. Anyway, but the starting point for me was hearing that, and then I remembered this paper, which you can't read, but um, this is a paper by a bunch of colleagues who are all at different places now, actually. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting thing is where do you work is another property, right? You know, who do you work with, who are your colleagues? But I still work with these, so Hamed Haddadi, who's at Queen Mary now, uh, Miguel Rio, who's still at UCL, Gianluca Yanaconi, who used to be at Intel, but now he's in Google, I think, or Cisco. Andrew Moore and Richard Mortier, who I work with. And this was looking at the internet topology. And the internet topology has been studied over time. Oh, there's a link to the paper, sorry, I need to hold that up. Um, and it's sort of slightly changed, but the first thing people noticed about the internet topology was that it has, uh, it appears to have a small world property. And in fact, the degree distribution of nodes in the internet is a power law. So what, what do I mean by degree distribution as a power law? If you plot it log log, you know, the number of people with this, with this degree and uh, what degree it is, you get, if you log log, you get a straight line. So that's a classic you know, instant power law fame. And so there are two nice things there. To, if you want to get on the front cover of um, nature, you get one of these things that has a power law and has a small world. And you go, yeah, we've got this another thing. And you probably don't anymore because it's so boring now. And it's all, you almost always have to be an applied physicist to do this. And anyone else from, from another discipline, it's almost impossible to get your paper there. Don't ask me why. They somehow guess. Um, and nothing against nature, but you know. Um, but anyway, my observation is that it's the, 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 these, these folks wrote this paper um, and noticed that the, the actual co coefficient on the power power law has slightly changed over time. Okay, not very much, but a little bit. Um, and of course, there's obvious reasons for that. The technology changes over time. We introduce new generations of technology. Some of them even have a clue in the name, like 2G, 3G, 4G. The G stands for generation, right? But also, fundamentally, they change, and in terms of graphs, they change. So, once upon a time, believe it or not, people dialed up the internet. They had a modem in it which made whirring sounds and their computer would speak to the modem using weird Hayes modem speak and tell it to ring up a number and then there'd be a rack of modems connected to a box in the back of a server computer and then you would be connected to the internet, maybe, if you're lucky on a good day. Um, and that, you know, that, there's probably some of that around still, I imagine. It's a good kind of last call emergency. If everything breaks, it might still work. Um, but then, you know, then along comes some other technology. So then we have this thing called broadband, which is a terrible name because it's strictly not, even, not particularly broadband, but it's faster, so bottom line. But most broadband consists of two different technologies. Uh, one is they use the phone line, but they throw away these bandpass filters that stop you whistling funny control messages at the phone exchange. And they also throw away the phone exchange, and they use the copper line, and then you modulate a much higher frequency signal over there, and they get more bits per second. So if you're in a 
you know, wealthy part of the world, like most of Europe, North, mm, some parts of North America, you might get 20 megabits a second up to a mile to the phone exchange or even a kilometer, um, and, uh, and you'd be happy. And that's ADSL, um, so a digital subscriber line, and asymmetric because if you, if you look at what most people do, they download more than they upload, so you give them even faster downlink but less uplink. Okay, but what's different about that is the topology that all the copper goes into uh, uh, now some digital subscriber line machine access machine at the phone exchange, and it's a different piece of technology. It's, it's uh, integrated, and so you can put a lot more fan out there. So old, old phone exchange might be in a couple of thousand things going into one exchange. A, a DSLAM, as it's called, might be 10,000 subscribers on one box. It's a much higher degree. The other, the other type of broadband access is cable. So you've got cable TV in a lot of areas in the world. I had this in France. There, I was in a, a year on sabbatical in Paris, and they had cable TV in the whole apartment block. And one cable branches out in the apartment block, and everyone shares the bandwidth on that. And so then you get another 1,000 people on one access point. So there's a degree of 1,000 in a single, single box. So it's a much higher degree at that edge of the network. In the middle of the network, if you look at the graph of the internet, there's these big, very fast routers. So big, fast router in the middle of AT&T or Verizon or BT or France Telecom, whatever, could be um, 64 times 40 gigabit a second. Might be a, a thing you see. So degree is 64. Of course, it's actually got lots of users' traffic going through, but if you're just looking at the static topology of the network, there's a, there's a node of 64. And then if you're a home user, your node is at degree one or maybe two if, if it's got a you know, home router and it's got Wi-Fi talking, or maybe 10 if you have lots of people around the house using lots of widgets. Okay, so, but it changes over time. The technology changes over time. So we have around 10 million people in the UK now on fiber to the home, but the fiber now offers way higher bandwidth, so you don't have this, you have a lower degree in the access point in the thing. And, and then there's a whole other level to this. So these two acronyms here matter. So the internet is a network of networks. So we don't just connect you know, the wireless network to stuff that talks to everyone else. We connect to a, a network provider, and the provider connects to other providers, and there's a bunch of rules how they interconnect, which are to do with economics. So it's now economic pressure on how these people set up their, their networking relationship. So ISPs, internet service providers, have two types of relationship. They can be peers. They, they regard each other as equal and they carry each other's traffic and they are each other's customers, or there can be a customer provider relationship, which is that they are a small ISP using a bigger ISP to get to the rest of the world. Okay, so then we have this bit more complicated because the world's now heterogeneous. Access internet providers are not the same as core internet providers, right? And then IXPs, internet exchange points, uh, are a next level up, which has emerged very recently, really. Um, London and Amsterdam have the two biggest in, I think, in Japan, probably the three biggest in the world. Um, these connect every ISP nearby, and all they do is interconnect ISP. They don't have any customers directly. They don't have any stuff. They're just a massive switches. Um, uh, if you're interested, you want to get into the London Internet Neutral Exchange called the Lynx. It's down in the uh, East End and River, and it's 13 buildings, and it's got triple-fold redundant fiber, and it's bulletproof and bomb-proof and really serious because everything goes through there. Uh, that's not quite true because there are two backups elsewhere that they don't tell people about. Anyway, so that's another level. And no doubt, as we move off planet and we go into the exoplanets, we'll have other stuff. You think I'm joking. There is a project called the Interplanetary Internet. It's serious. It was started by Vince Cerf with NASA about 15 years ago. And we have boxes going in orbit around Earth and heading to Mars so that when they first land on Mars, there'll already be internet access. So they'll be able to look at Facebook right away. They'll be able to post <laughs> pictures of Martian cats from the get-go. How cool will that be? Um, except the cats will be dying because there'll be weird Martian viruses. Anyway, okay, so there's sort of boring stuff about what makes a problem, you know, graph-like and got nodes and edges and graph problems that, uh, uh, you know, we're interested in uh, how you map things to nodes and edges. And quite often when you write software to do graphs, you flip this around so you can have edge-centric computing, you, know, you can do algorithms, uh, vertex-centric, edge-centric. And this is a fun thing if you're into implementing stuff on graphs. And graphs have all kinds of properties, like they may have modularity, i.e. clustering. Where do you see modularity, computer scientists, in code? People draw the call graph of code, which is you know, the function call graph of a bunch of code. You take a large piece of code, like, I don't know, uh, um, Spark or Flink or, or you know, Apache Web Browser or the Linux kernel or something. You know, go find the, you can build a call graph automatically. You just like, parse the code, and here's a call graph. And the, the functions are modular. But lo and behold, functions collect together in modules hierarchically, right? 
and the, the degree distribution of cool, the cool graph varies through the graph. And it varies over time because people upgrade the code. Sometimes they refactor the code, the most horrible experience in your life. If you have a large piece of code you've been working on for three years and then somebody goes, no, it's time to refactor. And everyone goes, hmm, should we go to the pub or we'll refactor? If we refactor, we won't be in the pub for another three months, right? So anyway, it happens. So many, I shouldn't say most, many interesting complex systems have some graph-like property. Uh, most is probably not fair, but you know, many. So here's a few pictures grabbed from, you know, gratuitous your sort of cover of nature type papers. He said bitterly because he's not a physicist. Um, no, I'm not bitter at all. Um, you know, friendship, uh, friendship graphs, friendship networks, and people uh, pulled out early bits for Facebook before Facebook went really private and walked a large chunk of it. Uh, it's hard to get now. You, you can't walk Facebook easily unless you get everyone to cooperate with you and, and run an app and, and walk little bits of it and then hand them back to somebody entirely altogether. Nobody's done that. It's kind of annoying. They should. But anyway, that's kind of friendship network. Scientific, I already talked about this. This is a co-authorship graphs, and my um, friend, colleague, student, Hyung Shik, uh, did this deliberate change to the, the courtship graph, as I mentioned, in security papers to make a Korean uh, security research group, which is cunning. Um, but this is, you know, looking at different, and of course, again, it's heterogen heterogeneous. Uh, just think, how many, how, how many, put your hand up if you've been on a paper with more than 10 authors on it. Come on, volunteers. Anyone in a room be on a paper more than 10 authors? There are no physicists in the room. If you're in particle <laughs> physics and astronomy, you know, a typical paper is 50 authors, right? A typical paper. Well, actually, there can't be any bioinformatics people either, because if you look at the human genome nature, the, there were two papers, and I think they're like 500 authors or something. So they had to put them in sort of extra material, you know. Whereas in computer science, you know, well, let me see this. This is quite a lot. One, two, three, four, six, six authors. That's a lot. Yeah. Anyway, so clearly the degree distribution is different immediately in different subjects, right? So that's a thing. Um, we care about it. Oh, this is interesting, yeah, business relationships in biotech. If you're really interested into this, business ties in economics, um, there's a study that was done by the uh, Open Data Institute in London that got all the ownership relationship, all the companies in the UK, and drew this graph. And they actually wanted to work out the, where were the um, attack point, where were the bad places that if they failed, the economy would be in bad shape. So uh, an interesting thing to do would be to take that graph and extend it to companies that are in a supply chain, value chain with people in the EU and not in the EU, and then say if you were to vary the successes of these companies up or down, how does that affect the UK? And I think there's some economists trying to do that here already uh, on some HSBC and other data, which is very cool. Um, but yeah, this is kind of interesting. If a particular bit of the, that graph fails, if it's very central, then it may cause cascading failure. There's um, a guy in Cambridge, uh, I'm desperately trying to remember his name, the professor of economic, applied economics, who did a study of infection and trust failure between banks during 2008 financial crisis, and he showed it was epidemically modeled, that was the best model, which is cool, right? So this stuff is, you know, it's useful. And all these different graphs show this genetic interaction. Now, I'm going to get back to that in a second, and there's a, a very early shot of the internet putting it on one page is quite tricky nowadays. I mean, we don't know what it all looks like. Um, I think there's lots of nice ways to visualize. The layout of graphs on the page is, you know, what do we, a gravity model, is that still the favorite one? Elastic band models for layout, laying out, visualizing graphs? I know. Uh, I think they're actually uh, AS relationship, ISP to ISP. So this is an AS level graph. So it's actually, there are on the order of 50, 000, 100, 50 to 100,000, I've lost track because it keeps increasing. ASs, which is ISP. So there were, last time I looked, there were 300 ISPs in the UK that had a presence most of the UK, just in the UK. So think of that times 150 countries. Um, oh, there's a really interesting property of the internet topologies. Well, one thing that changed over time, in 1992, all the internet was a collection that was connecting to a central node in the US, which is the ARPANET. And then the US government said, we're not paying for this anymore. What are you foreigners? What are you doing on our, using our interconnect here? Actually, they, it was more local. They said, why are we subsidizing this network? Clearly, it's working. It should just be a business. So they broke it up and sold it all off and had a bunch of things called regional networks, which became ISPs across the US. Recently, we've been working in deploying networks in Africa, and we discovered all the African different national network providers connect in the US. That's even worse than the UK connect, or the UK connected to France via the US. Or remember, 92, you know, UK to Sweden, right, the US. Now you go from, you know, Kenya 
uh, to South Africa via the US. This is completely barking mad. The fiber probably goes through South Africa and up around the coast of Africa. You're like, why don't you stop and pop out there? But they don't. And that's to do with the business relationships. So they've got this kind of different business and they have, have an established local business relationship and it's to do with interesting in economics. So that is kind of, okay, ecology networks also. Okay, so I'm gonna refresh on random graphs. This is gonna be really quick because I spent far too long time talking at a very high level. Erdos and Renyi, a very long time ago, 59, did this random graph model, which has basically got this one parameter, um, which is the probability of uh, uh, two nodes being connected. So it's a very simple model, right? And as you increase that probability from zero to one, you know, if it's zero, nothing's connected, you're isolated nodes. If it's one, everything's connected, you have a n, n minus one over two links, and your distance from here to everywhere is, is one hop. Right, and you can look at a number of edges easily. And in the middle, you've got something that's sort of somewhat connected. And there are interesting things about these kind of graphs. I'm not gonna rehearse it, but that's just there. Uh, the interesting one is this picture, which is uh, mean paths as you go up, there's a, sort of, uh, the, there's a sort of point at which you get an inflection and the size of the large component hits a certain watershed point and most things are connected after that point and then the path length starts to fall again, which is interesting. So those are sort of two properties of purely random graph. There's nothing magic about this. This doesn't actually describe much. This, um, sorry, much in the real world, it's a nice model, but the Erdos Renu, you know, the Erdos was definitely, you know, pure math person, here's some, here's a cool thing. Previously, people work on graphs, they were like, you know, going back a couple of hundred years, they'd be sort of Euler working out how many ways can you get across all the bridges, like none or one or whatever. Um, uh, so you'd have, or you'd have regular mesh graphs, they were regular stuff. Random graph was the first departure from anything that was, had some regularity. You know, of course, well, since Euclid, everyone's, you know, Everyone's happy with things like you know, regular polyhedra. And it's like got nice properties. You can work out the inner angles and all that stuff. Where, whereas the world isn't like that. So the this was the first step in heading towards the real world. Okay, so um, are we not very, um, okay, so, okay. There are two other models I just wanted to extend this. And these are sort of uh, Watson, Watson Strogatz. And then there are lots more refinements to these. Uh, but basically the, uh, the alpha and beta model, um, are that you don't pick somebody at random. You pick somebody to friend because they're friends with somebody you're already friends with, right? So this is the beginning of, you see this in quite a lot of work, um, sort of triads in network, a sort of building block. So you have sort of two edges and you add one and then you've, you've you, and you know, the eternal triangle, if you wanna have a sort of narrative XKCD, sort of romantic angle on it, um, you know, it's a thing. And, um, that's, you know, that, that. so that's a, that's a preferential attachment. The probability is now no longer random choice. It's that you have a higher probability to connect to people who are connected to people who are already connected to. Preferential attachment, also known as rich get richer in economics. And in the internet world, it's used to explain the power law, and it may not. But the idea is imagine you're starting a network provider. You want to be a network business. Where would you connect your network to in the internet? Will you connect to somewhere where the other networks are connected? So if you're starting an ISP in the UK, you connect to the London Internet Exchange because they're all there. Before that was there, you probably still connect to something in London because then you'd only be one or two hops from everyone else. So that preferential attachment is that that node is now getting richer because it's getting more business because that's more things flowing through it. Of course, it's also uh, you know, more likely to get infected with diseases or malware or be attacked by bad people or whatever because it's got more visibility, it's got more centrality. Its hubness has gone up, all those things. So that's the alpha model and it has some various properties. Uh, crucially, um, it has some, um, some notion you can extract what the clustering is in this. So if you do preferential attachment, as the rich get richer and get richer, then you get more and more clustering going on depending on how, what this, what the, probability of it, it preferentialness is of that attachment um, okay so this this is all old stuff this is like you know nothing new in this but it's a standard, um, standard so so depending how you vary the alpha in this model you decide do you want to make it more clustered or less clustered effectively that's what's going on there then there's also the beta model which is a, a bit of a refinement to this but this is slightly different this is a this is a model which comes I, th I think I Somebody can correct me. I think this comes from um, neuroscience, and it's sometimes known as a rewiring model. And I think it comes from the rewiring of the brain after things get broken. But actually, it also describes the formation of the network over time, where you start out with some um, collection nodes in a ring, and then you, with some probability, rewire them to other points on the ring. And again, this will exhibit somewhat different, actually, but it will exhibit some small world and clustering 
distribution as you vary beta in that model, okay? So I just want to get past all of that, but that's, that's revision. If you don't know it, there's lots of good books on Rough Theory 101. Um, okay, then, then there's these power law things. And this is, so clustering and the power law distribution, the degree distribution, the nature of degree distribution, uh, is uh, an interesting thing. Um, and uh, you can look at these power laws lots of different ways. The random graph model, you get Poisson. And if you do these uh, preferential attachment or rewiring and you get these power law, you may get these power law. And there's a lovely paper, uh, which we, I think we cite in here by, this is this, I think, I think if you want rare occurrences in computer science, there's a paper by Falutsos, Falutsos, and Falutsos. And they're three Falutsos brothers, and it's quite a famous paper. It's on power laws in the internet topology. And uh, I saw them present it. All three brothers were there, and it's quite interesting. One of them is bioinformatics, one of them's a machine learning, and one of them's a networking guy. He's at UC Riverside in California. And um, I, I think he presented it, sorry, because he was a networking dude. But it, all three of them got up, and it's like the three flying brothers, Falutsos, you know, it was like a kind of circus act. And, uh, um, and now we dispute that they're right. <laughs> we dispute it, and I dispute it because um, uh, basically, um, well, they're, they're roughly right, but it's, a, it's an average over the whole internet, and it's an average over the whole internet at a snapshot in time. And of course, the reason it's like that um, is that we have these generations of technology, and we add new bits at the edge of the network that use a new technology, and then we add new new bits at the edge of the network which add another technology, and they have different di degree distributions, although for various technology reasons, probably, they have not so different. So I mentioned the degree of... Uh, uh, a rack of uh, phone modems and versus a DSLAM versus uh, uh, a box that terminates a bunch of fiber. And they're not massively different, but they are somewhat different. So it would be nice to capture those differences. In particular, it would be nice if you want to capture the differences because um, you might want to know about what happens in malware attacks, weaknesses, where you want to strengthen things and so on. Uh, or you might want to figure out something about the economics of attachment that may be different here. It may be that this is profitable and this isn't profitable, for example. So you might want to go, okay, we're not going to use that tech because that degree distribution doesn't capture enough of that bit of the market or some other, some other property you're trying to deal with. Um, oh yeah, and, um, Albert and Barabazi are uh, the main authors of the stuff on, on the background to power laws. That, that, those graphs are from one of their things, I think. Okay, so my hippogrifically speaking, here's, here's my change to the model. So, so I'm gonna, I, I propose, take the, so I'm gonna do this in five minutes, four minutes. So I propose take the alpha and beta models because you know, the simple, simple original Erdos yeah, Reni stuff is too simple, but I quite like the idea of preference. I sort of buy the preferential and the rewiring arguments. And then why don't we just say we have generations and we now have an alpha prime or beta prime um, which, which could be, instead of just being um, that probability, they're the ratio of probabilities between each generation, or they're two probabilities, if you like. So we're now gonna have a distribution, but it's gonna vary from one generation to the next. So we're just gonna capture that. So in, instead of having somebody describes the network as a snapshot, and then we go, that's right, the next time we have a new generation of technology or a new generation of people, we say now we'll have alpha, sub two, alpha sub three, alpha sub four, if you're doing a rewiring version, beta sub two, beta sub three, beta sub four. If you're a computer scientist, we should have had alpha zero, but anyway. Um, so an example might be, uh, we might also, sorry, there are two different things here. One is we have, a, we have an alpha within, we have intra-generational alpha beta probability, and an intergenerational. Because clearly, if not, there isn't any connection between generations, then they're just separate networks, you don't have any, anything interesting. So I'm proposing that we model two things, one is, that distribution between one generation and the next, and in fact one and any subsequent or previous generation. And the second thing is how that, uh, how do we choose when we declare something to be a new generation? Okay, so instead of creating an incredibly complicated thing, we keep a very simple model, but we just say we have a sequence of those models, and then we have the sequence is by declaring something which may be, may be noticeable, uh, like a new technology in the internet would be an obvious one, or a new generation of people would be another obvious one, right? And here's you know, an example of what we might do for, for the intergenerational. You might say the probability of connecting to your parents and your kids is a quarter, the probability of connecting to your siblings is a half. 
I mean, you might constrain that, you know, to, to add up to one or to add up to the, the, the overall probability to be the, the, the mean to be the same over some amount of time. Or you could have other distributions there. You could say, you know, it varies with distance in generations with some, some power law. It could be, you know, 10 generations hence, you have a very weak probability of connecting. And you might eventually asymptote to zero or some other thing, right? So you might say, you know, 10 generations of technology, what's the probability of, you know, connected to somebody with a modem, zero, right? Or connected, what's, you know, 10 generations hence, what's the probability of friending somebody on Facebook, 10 generations hence, well, you're probably dead, right? Very, very high probability. Um, so you can feed in different distributions there, and then we can, how do we decide when we switch generations? I'd say that I would do it by observation, saying we have a technology, or we have a, we have a natural explanation. So that's why I put that word natural, we have a, a, a kind of basic idea there. And an interesting thing, I was just reading a book I would massively recommend to anyone who's just into science. Um, there's a book called The Gene by Siddhartha Mukherjee. And uh, he wrote a fantastic book previously called The Emperor of Maladies. He got Pulitzer Prize, which is, uh, he's an oncologist in Columbia University. And that was The Emperor of Maladies is a sort of history of uh, cancer treatment. But his latest book, The Gene, is just a history of a whole of gene, ge genetics, genomics, blah, 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 blah. And in that, um, he was talking about how easy it is to notice how many generations we are from Adam and Eve. Um, you know, if, and, and actually, by the way, yeah, you can tell because you can look at um, mitochondrial DNA and see how many changes there are. And it turns out we're down to, we can actually compute exactly about 200 and something thousand uh, uh, years, so it's sort of kind of on the order of 10,000 generations. And uh, we, we originally probably came from a pool of about a couple of hundred people, 200 to 800 people, and they'll be quite sure of the exact number, but that all of us are connected to one particular person. There actually is a sort of proto person, you can tell that from, and each generation, you get strictly more mutations in your, in your DNA. So you can actually spot uh, somebody who's a descendant and that they're a descendant. This is how when they went and dug up Richard III, or it was in the car park up in wherever, um, they found somebody who was known to be, and then they could check that he was, and they could reverse engineer. He went back enough generations that were recording this person's life, and they went, yeah, that, that must be likely him, or an unknown brother or something, you know, sibling. Um, and there are lots of other properties, obviously, in genes, and they're massively heterogeneous, you know, and of course they have, like, all kinds of different edge types because they express proteins in all kinds of weird interactions, and so I'm not going to pretend to talk anything about that, but I'm just saying there's another example of something which seems to be a v this very simple model sort of is a natural fit to one very simple aspect of things. So, so I apologize. I said this at the beginning, um, so I'm not going to apologize much. I'm not going to grovel. I haven't done anything to fit this to any data. I'm Purely, this is, you know, this is purely narrative me off the top of my head. It's an ad hoc seminar, right? This is not the results of work. It's a, a talk about an idea, which you can, you know, shoot me down for. So, you know, at some point, if I can find a, a minion or I get a spare minute away from doing, getting funding for my students, which is what I spend, or, you know, marking exams, I could do some actual work. I might actually take this model and fit it, you know, then I have to go and do some, graphics or somebody will tell me use something else um, and you know have to make some some fudge decisions I have to decide what constitutes a generation I would claim in the internet stuff would be quite easy I think it's a natural way of talking about that in a social network it's probably easy if people declare their familial relationship you know their parent children but they don't always and they lie so it's kind of not perfect hey this is statistics right so that's okay we can get it roughly right um, so and how many other kinds of networks is it? I'm sort of hoping I'm persuading you this is not barking mad but, you know, is it too complicated? I think it might be. Um, I mean, I was trying to appeal to the idea that there are places you drop in a distribution. So in one case, you may not need to describe more than three generations in, in family. Or, well, well, no, wait, five in my family at the moment. So, but, you know, is that, is, is that a bit not arbitrary? Um, but in another case, you want an infinite sequence of those, and you want to describe some distribution over that, and you have to decide when you, when you flip to some kind of ep epoch flip and so on. And does it actually make things simpler? I mean, does it actually help? So does, does, does this allow you to run modularity detection within a generation and then separately across generations so that you can do some kind of multi-scale version of algorithms without losing any uh, or without losing too much accuracy, for example? You're trying to find clusters or, or centrality, or K-click or whatever, but you do it generation and then intergeneration. That might help, and it might, it might be that if, if you do this on measured data, that it's okay. It might not. It might be terrible. 
Um, and then there's some interesting things about the math of this. Well, they may not, they may be completely bogus. But one thing is, do you want to, uh, do you want to take the global parameter you observe, you know, overall time for the whole network? So you take the internet and take the degree, take the, yeah, the actual graph of the internet and say, take its properties and then take snapshots over time and take them over technology generations. And do you want a description that makes sure that the distribution of distributions matches the, the top level or does that not matter? Is that, you know, not a requirement for algorithms to work right? Um, does it, 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 it it may be there's some, okay, why, why do I, what's my intuition behind that? My intuition is there may be some global properties about a communication network or a telecommunication network or a gene regulatory network or whatever that are, you know, some kind of invariant. And so you want to make sure that all the subgraph and subtemporal graph properties do fit the invariant still, maybe, because there's some sort of driving constraint up there. That's very, very, very hand wavy. Um, but in, you know, and then the other thing is, a, you know, a really perverse mathematician would go, I don't know, we'll make them really weird and we'll make them deviate completely weird ways so that we don't retain those properties and see what happens to our graphs. Uh, you know, what kind of graphs do you create? And maybe those are graphs gone wrong. There are things where, you know, cancer has hit and the cell uh, 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 signaling network changes in some radical way. That might be interesting too. Who knows? Okay, that is the end of the talk and that is the end of the time. So we have minus one minute for questions. <laughs>